Hey guys, uh, this is my first time doing a video post about anything, so I hope it turns out okay. Um, but before I get into it, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself for those that don't know me and also why I'm doing this. Uh, my name is Colin, and one of the things I like to do is argue, particularly about philosophy and theology. And in the past, uh, I've been huge fans of YouTube channels from guys like Scott Clifton and Theoretical BS and DOS American Atheist. And I've always thought about doing a video of my own in that same fashion. And it just so happens that recently uh, I've been noticing a lot of video posts from my friends on Facebook uh, of an evangelist named Josh Fierstein. And in his videos, he tries to uh, destroy evolution over the course of three minutes. Um, and of course, after watching a few of those videos, I thought to myself, this would be uh, a good opportunity to kind of dive into this and, uh, and try to construct an argument to go against uh, his perspectives and his views. So here we go. Uh, for some reason, the concept of creationism and evolution are always talked about and debated as if they're competing answers to the same question. In some ways, they are antithesis to one another, but if you take the time to properly analyze each concept, you'll find that they really answer different questions. Let's start with creationism, the, which is the leading example of existentialism amongst Christian groups and individuals. At its core, creationism attempts to answer how the universe, as we're currently able to perceive it, came into existence by postulating that God created it over the course of seven days. Uh, now, if you read the Bible, you can see this in First Genesis. Um, and in Genesis, the Bible tells us that God simply uttered a few words, and in the blink of an eye, the world and everything around it was created. Now, as majestic as this may sound, it's rather absurd, and I can say this with some certainty for at least two reasons. The first reason is while the Bible does an excellent job of illustrating these events, it neglects to describe in any detail as to how it happened. Now, it should be noted that the Bible is not a scientific journal accounting the day-to-day -day actions of God. It's an episodic storybook, albeit a good one. And in these stories, it uses a lot of metaphors to convey its messages. Metaphors by design are not meant to be taken literally, so it would stand to reason that the story of Genesis is also not meant to be taken literally. The second reason deals with credible sources, and I think we all know that a story can be either fiction or nonfiction, and the greatest determining factor as to which it is are the sources from which the story is derived. Obviously, there are a lot of people in the world that would claim the story of Genesis to be a factual account, but ironically, the one place they all get their information from, the one body of evidence that goes to the credibility of creationism, is the Bible itself. Now, in order for me to construct a full argument against the validity of the Bible, I would have to research all of its authors as well as their own sources, which nine times out of ten funnels back to God. Uh, I would also need to explore the notions dealing with God's divinity, particularly his omnipotence, his ability to just be able to will something into existence. And when we get into that topic, that is a whole other can of worms that... Uh, I don't really have the time and frankly don't even want to try to open. So for the sake of argument, let's say that the theory of creationism holds some weight. And you'll understand why I'm calling it a theory a little bit later on. Creationism only attempts to answer one question, and that's how the universe came into existence. It doesn't provide any concrete explanation as to the current state of our universe. It doesn't explain why there are different ecosystems and different animals in different parts of the world. And it doesn't explain how we as humans have been able to produce ever advancing technology or form vast civilizations from such small, simple gatherings. So to help answer that question, we can look to evolution. Now, before I go into evolution, I first want to simply define what it is. And the reason why is because I feel many people, particularly religious people, only seem to be concerned with one facet of the entire concept. And that's how it relates to the origins of things. In actuality, evolution doesn't attempt to answer how things began, only how they came to be what they are now. It's a graduate development of something from a simple to a more complex point. Let me say that again. It is a gradual development of something from a simple to a more complex form. I hope I said that right the first time. Um, this can mean how a species alters its physical and chemical construct in order to become better suited for its environment, or how a person learns and perfects a skill that they'll be able to use later on. It's a chronicle of change that is observed through hindsight. Now what that means is that we must have first observed something in a primary state of being and over time we note how it has changed. 
Now, this kind of observation is strikingly similar to the scientific method. And if you're not familiar with that process, first we ask ourselves a question. For instance, why an organism takes on a certain form or shape. We then conduct some background research. We observe the organism in its natural habitat. We try to compare it against other organisms that may look or act similarly. And then we construct a hypothesis based on our observations. We then perform experiments or conduct further research to help support our hypothesis. And lastly, we compare our new findings against it in order to form a conclusion. So to correct Josh's assertion that evolution is not a science because it was never observed, um, yeah, it kind of is. Just because we couldn't observe the evolution of primordial organisms doesn't mean that we can't form a reasonable conclusion based on fossil records that may point us in a specific direction. And unlike creationism, which is a theory, even by Josh's own standards, evolution is an ongoing fundamental process that is so prevalent and apparent in our world that we easily overlook its effects. It's how children learn to read. It's how bacteria becomes resistant to antibiotics. It's the reason why our cell phones have the ability to access the far reaches of the internet. All of these are a result of evolution. Now that we've kind of gotten that out of the way, I want to hit on some points that Josh brought up in, in both of these videos. Um, the first one being his attempts to illustrate how it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. And in doing so, he, he brings up a few misconceptions. One of which is that all life was derived from a single cell, or a protein, depending on which video you watch. While that may be the case, before we can arrive at that single cell, first there must be matter with which to construct it. Now, next to creationism, the Big Bang Theory is the most reasonable and acceptable scientific explanation for the creation of the universe. It is believed to be the moment when time, space, and all of matter, down to the smallest neutrino, was, came into existence. Now, if you don't know what a neutrino is, there is an excellent interactive scale of the universe done by um, Kerry and Michael Hong. I'll try to leave uh, a link to it down in the description that I, I would encourage you guys to go see it. And just it's amazing to see the sheer magnitude of the different elements that are in our universe. Even so, creationists like to argue that this occurrence seems more like an accident and the probability of such an event is so astronomically small I think Josh uses his number 1 in 10 to the 243rd power that this seems unreasonable instead they opt to go the faith-based route of creationism faith is not something that is quantifiable at least not in in my experience you'll, you'll never hear a Christian say on a scale of 1 to 10 I believe in God uh, 7 uh, it, it just doesn't work like that. It's you either believe or you don't. So it's not quantifiable. In essence, it has no probability. Now ask yourself which is more likely to occur. Something that has a ridiculously low probability or something that has no probability. Uh, the logical answer would obviously be the former. Nevertheless, Creationists like Josh maintain the idea that the Big Bang and the process of evolution are still nothing more than accidents which don't conform to the parameters of science. His first criteria was observation, and we've shown that to be untrue. Uh, then he goes into probability, and along with probability is the potential ideal conditions for production. Now, in efforts to support his claim, he misrepresents the laws of thermodynamics by stating that it shows how chaos can never produce order. Well, that's not what the laws of thermodynamics do. In actuality, they do more to discredit Josh's claim by explaining how chaos creates the potential conditions for homeostasis. Now, if you're not familiar with the laws of thermodynamics, I'll try to break it down to you as, as best I can because it's a little, little confusing even for me. Um, but the first law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only reshaped. The best example of this is the way our body consumes and uses outside sources of energy. We convert food into energy that resides in our body for future use and we expel the waste. Now, the waste isn't truly wasteful. It still has the potential for production, but for whatever reason, our body doesn't use it. And I know it may be kind of gross to think about, but once that waste leaves our body, it can be absorbed back into the ground to help fertilize and nourish plants that we will continue to eat over and over again and thus continuing the cycle of energy. The second law, and this is the law that I think uh, Josh tries to attach to his own point of view is that the potential for chaos or as the laws refer to it as entropy, the potential is always increasing. So 
Think about a match the moment before it's lit. In that moment, the potential for entropy is set to zero. Now, it's never actually at zero, which will be explained in the third law. But once that match is lit, entropy increases, chaos increases. And with this increase, the potential for various outcomes increases, the potential for production increases. It's kind of like saying you can do more damage with a lit match than you can in an unlit match. Now, I know that's not really an apt analogy for the creation and sustainment of, of life, but it's true. The more there is going on, the more potential there is for things to happen. The third law, and this is where uh, Josh's perspective kind of gets shot to, to hell, is that the chaos or entropy can never reach the value of absolute zero. Basically, a body at rest stays at rest. So if there's nothing going on, then there's no potential for uh, production. There's no potential for life. Um, so with a better understanding of the laws, we can see how chaos can not only produce order, but that it's necessary to do so. Order doesn't just happen spontaneously and instantaneously. First, there must be chaos, and through the course of change, the ideal conditions are met and maintained. Think of it as trying to put a Phillips head screw into a piece of wood. There are numerous tools that you can use to get the job done, but once you find that ideal tool, you don't continue down the line using tools that may make it harder to complete the task. You use the same tool over and over again. That is order. That is the ideal sequence in which things or events occur. Now, keeping in line with the idea of order, I want to go into a couple more arguments that Josh makes relating to cause and effect and the ongoing process of evolution. Now, the laws of cause and effect are derivative of the physics, uh, laws of physics. Um, basically, one of them stating that something cannot come from nothing. The universe has to have come from somewhere. Uh, creationists always like to say that God was that catalyst. Um, so, as you can see, the laws can be interpreted both spiritually and scientifically, and this is the reason why both sides like to argue the point. Uh, obviously, the spiritualists prefer to use creationism and intelligent design, while the atheists are inclined to believe in the Big Bang Theory and evolution. The kicker here is that neither side can definitively prove their own theory. Um, so, if you're ever in this kind of argument with somebody and they bring up the laws of cause and effect, it's best to just agree to disagree and move on because neither one of you will have the right answer, at least not in the eyes of the other person. Now. Order in relation to evolution is fairly straightforward. The idea that humans are evolved from lesser primates is not just a speculation. There's plenty of research that shows just how similar we are both physically and chemically. In fact, we share 99% of our genetic makeup with chimpanzees. But that 1% difference is enough to make us distinctly different from one another. And it's that 1% that spiritualists like to use as the major gap between humans and primates. It's the literal and figurative stopping point of evolution. And they're somewhat right. But then they go on to ask and assert that if evolution is this ongoing process, why are there still just monkeys and still just humans? Why are there not a hybrid of two out there? Well, the reason is because evolution doesn't exactly work like that. In order to defend this, we would need to introduce the idea of natural selection. At one point, there may have been a hybrid of us. Uh, there may have been a hybrid of monkey and human, but the reason why we don't see them today is because of natural selection. The traits that were best suited for our specific environment were reproduced, while those that weren't were disregarded. This may seem like a simple explanation, but the reality is that's simple. Um, the only problem that I see with natural selection is that because of it, we may never be able to find that proverbial missing link. And that's okay. It's In science, it's okay to say, I don't know, or to uh, conclude that we may never have the answer. The last thing I want to hit on is something that I think we all should take kind of personal. Uh, in his second video, uh, Josh brings up the idea that science and evolution, while it may be able to explain life, it cannot explain human consciousness. It cannot explain the thoughts and emotions that we have, and in turn can't explain the precepts for our morality. Now, if you believe this to be true, I would encourage you to watch a video by Sam Harris. Um, he's a world-renowned um, uh, skeptic and neurobiologist, and he's done several uh, videos and in, 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 um uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Debates with other known theologists are about this issue. Um, 
And in this video, he argues against that very point. Science may not be able to answer every objective moral question, but it can help us deduce why we think and act certain ways. Not all of our emotions and behaviors are hardwired into us like Josh claims them to be. They're not all given to us by God. They are the result of evolutionary influence. Uh, Josh goes on to argue that the reason why there's so much corruption, chaos, and ill will in this world is because of this popularized evolutionary mindset. That because this is all just an accident, we don't place any value on ourselves or other people, and that we are incapable of leading purposeful and moral lives without God. Um, I would say I'm a little bit offended by that notion, but I've learned that being offended uh, by something, especially an opinion that is so overtly closed-minded, uh, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't accomplish anything. So um, just because what I believe to be my purpose or my lot in life, and just because it doesn't match up with what you think it should be, doesn't make it any less important or less valuable. Um, I hope that we could all agree that regardless of where we sit, on the spiritual spectrum, there is the potential to do great things with our lives. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you guys for taking the time to watch this video. Thank you to Josh for putting up his first two videos because I don't think uh, I would have had the courage to do this if he had not uh, if he had not done his videos and uh, I know a lot of times people tend to think that uh, this form of rebuttal or this form of, uh, of argument is, is being conflictive and uh, but really I have nothing against Josh I, I, he seems like a, a stand-up guy and again I'm, I'm glad that he's as passionate about what he believes in as, as am I and you know maybe one day we'll get a chance to sit down and have a beer and talk about this but until that time um, if he sees this and he has anything that he wants to come back with, or if any of you out there uh, have anything that you would like to ask, uh, comments, questions, grievances, and that's that's an homage to Scott Clifton, um, feel free to, to record them and, and send them to me. I'd love to see them. Um, but in the meantime, uh, be well and peace be with you.